This is me before. I would wake up 20 minutes prior to work, I would then rush to the office, have a massive dip after lunch before heading home and watching Netflix to unwind the rest of the day. Then, 24 hours before final exams, I would pull an all-nighter to learn the entire course material. This is me now. I still watch Netflix, but I consistently work every night for around two to three hours. I have been doing this since I enrolled as a Georgia Tech student last year, and what I learned is that being productive is not about increasing motivation. I know this because I am the laziest person of all time. In this video, I will talk about five tips and how they have helped me study while also working full-time as a software engineer. I think at this point, some of you might still not be convinced. You might be thinking, George, you are an Amazon software engineer. You are now doing a master's degree in Georgia Tech. And you also mentee computer science students. Maybe you're just talented. Well, back when I was in high school, I was in a program called Ivy, and we had this thing called an extended essay. I needed to write 4,000 words. Well, I left it to the last day and pulled an entire all-nighter before handing it in 20 minutes before the deadline. A week later, my teacher asked me into their office, and they're like, hey, George. And I was like, Hey, Mr. Devonham, George, I called you in because this is the best extended essay I've ever read. Yeah, that did not happen. It was a very, very bad essay for me. So Nope was not talented enough to pull that off. So basically, I am not Ali Abdal. I am not Elizabeth Phillips. I'm not any of those productivity gurus that you see out there on YouTube. Hence, the tips I'm about to share are rooted from a perspective of somebody who is literally the laziest person in the world. This leads me to my first tip. Unleash your inner motivational radar. A fellow YouTuber, Elizabeth Phillips, explains this better than me, but to summarize, there's two things happening throughout the day. Number one, you're always starting at a set amount of motivation and it's always going down throughout the day. Number two, your inability to resist temptation slowly increases throughout the day as well. As a result, I would like to think of motivation as a finite resource each day. Particularly due to my ADHD, I like to think of the average person maybe starting at maybe 80-90% motivational levels depending on the amount of sleep that they got, but me, I always start at around 50%. In Elizabeth's video, she mentions using the three-part split. Essentially, tasks are split into three categories. One is high energy and high temptation essentially activities that you don't enjoy that much and require high brain power and time. So this is maybe like studying an exam or projects that you've been procrastinating on. There's also high energy and low temptation, AKA enjoyable activities that require a time commitment, such as going to the gym or doing fun research. And third, things that require low energy and low temptation, AKA fun activities that don't require that much time, such as creative projects, reading, or watching a movie. Well, I think the tips of splitting up tasks is super important. I also think that it always starts with knowing your motivational levels at the current state that you're in. Oftentimes, individuals neglect this aspect and attempt to embark on these ambitious activities before their mind is adequately prepared. And this leads to heightened frustration when they realize they're procrastinating. As a lazy person, I just try to keep things super simple. If I have something hard that needs to be worked on, I wait till the morning to work on it. Everything else for that day just depends on how I feel and whether or not I want to do that activity. However, during all times of the day, I'm thinking, how tired am I? How much motivation do I have for the rest of the day? I really think it starts with self-awareness of your personal motivation levels. Number two, mastering the art of emotional control in the workspace. So going back to my initial days in college, I would always wait 48 hours before a midterm and then speed run through the entire course content. I was in my ADHD hyperfocus, fight or flight mode, and this worked really well for me. And from the outside, it looked completely fine. I would wait 48 hours, but I would still get A's um, and achieve my Asian dream of being a high achiever. But the problem was that this left me incredibly, incredibly anxious because of how hard the process was. And think about it, the next time I heard the word exam, I would go back and remember how hard it was previously and the amount of effort it took to study for 48 hours and pull all those all-nighters to get the grade that I wanted. It's because procrastinating and studying last minute helped me survive, but it also made it difficult to start the next time I wanted to do this particular task. And this is a never-ending cycle that got worse and worse. Think about different words that might cause fear for you. What do you think when I say, work. What emotions are you having? What about the word deadline? What about phrases like the end of the holidays, the end of the weekend? How does this feel for you? And if your answer is, I'm anxious, I'm scared, I feel my heart rate increasing. Think about why that is. Why do you feel that way? 
To alleviate the anxiety that I felt for these tasks, my first step was to recognize that these are not monolithic entities. What I mean by monolithic entities is that the process of an exam is not one single thing. Elizabeth mentions this as well, calling it her impossible principle, where she feels that in order to feel like she's done the task, she has to complete it all the way through. But that's my main point. It's not one single task. If you think of exam as one single thing, it's gonna feel like this huge weight that you can't complete. What I encourage people to think about instead is that these words such as exam or tasks is one big puzzle that can be split into smaller pieces. Of course, looking at the whole puzzle image is so scary. But what if you could just think about it one puzzle piece at a time? Then it makes it a lot less scary. What is the simplest version of this task that you can do at the moment? The second thing I did was just not think of the task at all. I don't think about the word exam. I don't think about the word deadline because they aren't specific enough. I try to think about only what I need to do for the next 30 minutes and I try to be as specific as possible. Maybe it's just looking at lecture slides, reading the first 10 slides, writing the opening paragraph for my essay, but I always try to keep it specifically in my mind what I need to do rather than the entire task as a whole. This might sound super simple, but I do think that we kind of get caught in our minds a little bit in terms of, oh, this task is so huge rather than really thinking about the small pieces that need to be done. The third thing I really do is just try to remove the anxiety of this task completely. I try to remember how I felt completing the exam, how I felt while working on it, and I realize that it's not so difficult um, and that I enjoy completing things. And by changing the context of these words and how they feel in my mind, it makes it feel a lot better and a lot easier to get started. But I mean, it's not going to be easy. We've associated negative emotions for these tasks for so long. It's gonna take a lot of work and effort to sort of disassociate our anxiety and our negative feelings towards these words. Number three, explore in order to make the task simple. It needs to exist in your headspace in that simplest form. An example I like to give is my current work process with YouTube. It used to be so sporadic. And that's because I associated negative emotions and made the task monolithic to just making a video. And <clears throat> making a video has so many subcomponents, so I started breaking them down. If any of these tasks are still super stressful, then I try to break it down even more. For example, anxiety over filming. This was last week's video and the timeline was huge. And if I thought of editing as this one thing, I would just be super anxious about it. So I tried to break it down even further. Furthermore, I always try to think about specifically how long each task is going to take. This seems simple, but there's a huge problem. Say you're starting a new task and you have anxiety because it's new. You also don't know how long the task is going to take. This is where I think it's super crucial to let go of high expectations when you're starting something new. Unfortunately, as we get older, our burden of expectation for ourselves just gets worse and worse. You never want to do a new task because you don't want to break it down. We can't deal with the anxiety of, I don't know this task. I don't know how to break it down. You know, we wake up, we brush our teeth, we go to work, we eat, we do the things and hobbies that we like to do because we know them. So they're not anxious because we know each task step by step. In the movie Up, this idea gets depicted extremely well. Life passes by happily, but you forget your younger selves where you wanted to explore more. Carl here remembers their original dreams to go to Paradise Falls. I think this is an issue a lot with upbringing as well as for me, for example, with um, my Asian family. The burden comes from trying to be great and always having this perfectionist mindset. And it prevents us for, from exploring because we feel like we won't be able to meet that expectation that we've set for ourselves. And I'm always aware of this and trying to remove this from my thoughts so that I can get into a task and take it as an exploration instead of having such high expectations. Exploring and experiencing setbacks is a task in its own right. So don't burden yourself with trying to make progress in the beginning and really trying to be fast at this stage. Four, elevate task convenience to the max. Let me set the scene. Every New Year's, we make resolutions to use calendars, write lists on Notion to help keep a certain routine. We buy new notebooks, markers, pens, all in hopes of being organized. Here's the problem. These organizational tasks are not hard, but they're also not convenient enough. 
Every time I start to use a new to-do list system or calendar, I give up eventually. I watch all of these productivity gurus and what they do, but I think it works for them because they aren't lazy. My point is, is that if it's too hard, we're not going to do it. Consequently, when I consider adopting a new organizational method, I always question whether or not I find it convenient or enjoyable. So instead, what I do is rather than navigating through a calendar, setting dates and going through that process, I simply use Siri. I also do similar things with studying. One thing I know is that it's really hard to get set up and open up all the lecture slides. And what I literally do is I just have a desktop that just keeps everything open. I just don't close it on my laptop. Tip number five, tandem taming dull tasks. Some assignments are boring. Some work-related tasks are boring. Sometimes I have to work on a schedule and add items for work. Sometimes I just have to review lecture slides that are just not interesting, but I have to get it done. If it's not possible for me to automate it, then I always try to pair a boring task with something that's super fun. For example, I watch basketball while looking through some of my lecture slides. Eventually I get into a groove of things where I can close basketball and just look at the slides. I typically always try to pair a boring audio task to a physical task that's fun. Just doing both can make both of those aspects a lot more enjoyable than before. And it also gives me some Pavlovian conditioning. Like whenever I start a new lecture, I'm like, oh, this is a quick um, reminder to do some of the household tasks I need to complete. And pretty much all of my fun tasks are paired with a task that I don't want to do. And it's helped me improve my perception of these dolls tasks. Um, I know soccer is always going to be fun, but if I pair it with something boring, it's not going to make soccer, maybe it'll make soccer a little bit less fun, but it's still going to be enjoyable for me to watch, but it just makes the doll tasks a lot more fun. And it just like essentially balances these things out. And there's a lot of ways to potentially make a doll task more interesting. And it's up to you to think about how you can tandem pair it with something to tame this doll task or to incentivize yourself to work on these things more and more.